All right, I know that folks will continue to join us um, throughout our time together, but your time is also precious, all of you who have joined us tonight. So I would love to get started and um, introduce you all to Dr. Bird. But before that, a little bit about me and RMN. My name is Ophelia Hukini. She, her, hers are my pronouns. And I get to do communications at Reconciling Ministries Network. At RMN, we work for queer and trans justice in the United Methodist Church. And we have been doing this work for 40 years, thanks to supporters and wonderful people like you all. Yes, thank you. You all actually make it happen every day. Um, we are also a movement of over 40,000 people around the world and over 1,400 um, reconciling ministries. So that includes churches, congregations, Sunday schools, choirs, um, handbell choirs, regional groups, even a few universities and colleges. I'm sure I'm missing a category out there. But anyway, you get the point. There are a whole lot of you. Normally, you would see and hear from my beloved colleague, um, Reverend Emily Bagwell, during events like this. But as some of you may know, um, Emily recently had a baby. And she and the baby are doing well. Their whole family is doing well. Um, but therefore, she is on leave until March. So I get the privilege of being with you all tonight and also of introducing Dr. Bird. Dr. Jennifer Grace Bird has taught in New Jersey, Texas, Tennessee, North Carolina, Oregon, and Virginia. Um, and that's everybody so far, but TBD. Um, on the side, she carves out time somehow for speaking and writing on marriage in the Bible. She has a background in the United Methodist Church and also in the Presbyterian Church by way of her education. She's also a longtime friend of the Reconciling Movement. And um, one of the projects that she has undertaken with RMN is, um, it may sound familiar because it's also the name of talk for tonight and um, the book that um, Dr. Bird has undertaken to write but it's called Marriage in the Bible. It's a video series. It's um, The subtitle is A Discussion Among Friends. And if you're interested in learning more about Dr. Dr. Bird's work, you can go to jennifergracebird.com. So I'll put that in the chat. And that video series is also there. The intro is free and the rest are available for rent if you'd like. Um, Dr. Bird has also undertaken six years of graduate work in biblical studies and more than 20 years of teaching in classrooms, including at Hollins University, the University of Portland, Greensboro College, and currently she is teaching at Portland Community College. Um, I think that that's, gosh, a whirlwind tour of a little bit about your life, Dr. Bird. If there's anything that I've left out that you would love to share with folks, um, Please feel free to share more, but otherwise, I am so excited that we get to hear from you today. Thank you so much for your time and your expertise and wisdom. Mm, thank you, Ophelia. It is definitely my, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm, uh, you hit some really important highlights. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, I think there's one quick thing I'll add and, or two quick things I'll add. One is I was living in North Carolina when they passed a, they passed an amendment or amendment went up for a vote, um, state constitutional amendment that effectively defined marriage as between a man and a woman. It wasn't the point of it, but it did that as a side effect. And that's what got me involved in this work as a biblical scholar. Why this, that's when I got involved in this topic. Um, and then the other thing I want to say is that um, I first spoke, got to speak at just a weekend conference, a RMN conference in north of Seattle in 2015. And, and I, what I did was a presentation of marriage in the Bible and trying to cram that all into an hour. Someone came up to me afterwards, a very kind uh, young man came up to me afterwards and he said, that was a lot of really important content, but I feel like I need to sit down and like very slowly digest one bite at a time. And I, you know, I was kind of like, yeah, you do. <laughs> like, a, you know, a person of faith, a Christian needs to be able to understand all of these different pieces and that and that's ultimately what led me to create that video series that you did announce and i appreciate that and then more importantly the book because that gives you 
more depth than, you know, the video series is just 15 to 18 minute videos that I'm expecting people to watch together as a group and then talk about together afterwards. So anyway, I'm, I'm looking at the faces of the people who are here and I'm reminded that there is a lot of content um, that I think people have, I think Christians would want to know, United Methodists would want to know and, and be able to process for yourself. So I have, you know, 35 minutes to <laughs> 45 minutes, something like that, to try to hit the highlights that will answer the questions that Ophelia listed in the event an announcement. Um, and that's not a lot of time because there's a lot to say about each topic. And by the way, if you hear my cat in the background, she is fine. She's not hurt. That's just how she meows. And she might even sit on my lap for part of this. I hope you're okay with that. Um, so I want to say a couple things up front. If it wasn't clear from what Ophelia said, thank you very much. Um, I am an ally and I'm a biblical scholar. And what that means practically in this moment tonight for you to understand about my work um, as a biblical scholar, I don't need to, um, I don't need the scriptures. I don't need to try to bend the scriptures to validate my convictions. And I don't need to redeem the Bible. I, I think it's actually more important at this point in time for people to be very honest about what the Bible does say and what it doesn't say to wrap our minds around that. And then, and then in a lot of cases, at least on this topic of marriage, what it also means is that we're going to bring into conversation with that, what we know now about humanity, human sexuality, relationships, all of those things that, that elements of biblical texts might actually undermine. So that we need to be able to say what this biblical passage and even at times what Jesus is saying is not healthy and helpful for us today. So I don't know where any of you all are who are here tonight. If that just frightened you that I just said you might need to challenge something that Jesus has said. I don't know. I don't know where you all are with this. Um, but I'm kind of coming in being a little bit of full force here's what the Bible says, and sometimes here's what Jesus or Paul says, and it is okay, I'm giving you all permission, it's okay to challenge any part of what is contained in scripture. For me, and then as a, as a, as a seminarian, and then as a graduate student, what it meant is I needed to just be okay with what's going on in the Bible and name it, call it out, but God is beyond the Bible or whatever words work for you in understanding that there's more than just what the Bible says. And so I feel like without you knowing me, <laughs> this might not, this might not sit well for some of you. I'm just going to say that because what the Bible does and doesn't say about these topics is actually, well, surprising. I'll just leave it at that. And I will, I'd like to say before I start then, um, that there is a lot more to say than what I'm going to say tonight, <laughs> right? Because I've written a whole book about it, right? So I and very intentionally tried to come up with the highlights on all of these topics, right? Um, trusting that you will know that there's more, there's more going on in all of these than we have time to cover, but I wanted to at least, you know, get some of these questions rolling, right? So the topics for this evening, then I'm taking this straight from this, the flyer and we're going to roll with it from there. So what does, does the Bible condemn same-sex marriage? What does the Bible say about divorce? What does it say about sex before marriage? And what is biblical marriage? So I, you know, again, I don't, I don't think of a lot of people in the United Methodist Church using that phrase biblical marriage, but other people do, other Christians do, and you might, or you might know some people who do, maybe some people in your congregation do, I don't know. Um, so, so ultimately, and it's actually quite fascinating to me, even people beyond the Christian church think about marriage sometimes through the lens of 
what people who use the phrase biblical marriage, what they think it is, that is how a lot of people think about marriage, even if you're not, it's really kind of fascinating. So it's a really, it's a relevant thing to talk about. Um, and I'm going to get started here. So we're going to, we're going to start with the good stuff, right? Um, does the Bible condemn same sex, same sex marriage? The short answer is no, it does not. Okay. Hmm. Huh. That's weird because I know about these passages in the Bible that say X, Y, and Z, right? No, what's why it does not condemn same sex marriage is there are no same sex marriages being talked about. Therefore, there's no way for it to actually be condemning that. What it's very clear on, and this is this is an element of the larger conversation, it does condemn in about three passages out of the entire Christian Bible, right? Sex acts between two men. It never condemns sex acts between two women, which is actually part of the thing to sit with and discuss and mull over, right? I mean, I think I think a lot of what I'm saying tonight is probably not new, but I'm hoping that I'm bringing it together in a way maybe that's new for you. What is I'm going to say this several times tonight in, you know, the next 30, 35 minutes. If you haven't already sat with this piece of the conversation yet, I'd very much like you to consider that the conversation about marriage today. No, 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 no. Well, it is also today, but the conversation about marriage in the Bible is focused on sex. Um, a man having sex with a woman and biblically speaking, sex is, is a thing that a man does to a woman. Every single time, every single reference to marriages that we see or people talking about a marriage, it's in light of sex. Paul only talks about marriages in light of sex. When Jesus talks about it, it's in light of sex. It's not in light of the a healthy relationship or what's going on in terms of the bonds being created and all of that. So no wonder people of faith today continue to talk about marriage through the lens of sex and whether or not it can be procreative. The biblical texts teach people to think about it that way. So I had to give myself a lot of grace and forgiveness on that when I realized that about myself. So. So no, it can't be condemning a thing that didn't exist, okay? It does condemn sex acts, which is not the same thing as talking about a sexuality. I have quite a few videos, by the way, this is tangent, but also absolutely related. Um, I have a video series in my, on my YouTube channel. The video series is called, Does the Bible Tell You So? And there are, and I, those are short videos, but I have like six or seven of those videos are talking about the topics that we're covering today, or they're related to the topics we're covering tonight. And so this issue of sexuality versus sex acts, right? The Bible talks about acts. It doesn't even have a, an acknowledgement of human sexuality as some form of orientation as we do know of, right? About for humans today. So Let's move on. So talking about these others then also inform kind of in a back end way what's going on here in terms of talking about the Bible for LGBTQ folks and or even really for, for anyone um, in the church. Um, so what does the Bible say about divorce? If we were meeting face to face, I would have a few minutes to ask you all to talk about it. Like, what do you think it says? What do you what have you heard? What do you think, you know, what do you know that it says? What do you think it says? What, what does the Bible say about divorce? I know that I've heard more than I can count people say that the, you know, divorce is a sin. You can't, you know, divorce is a sin. The Catholic church is pretty strong on that, but so are, so are some of the Protestant and non-Catholic traditions that divorce is kind of considered a sin, but why? Okay. So let's, um, let's be clear about a couple things. I refer to the what Christians usually call the Old Testament, I call that the Hebrew Bible. And what Christians usually call the New Testament, I call that the Newer Testament for language reasons and inclusivity reasons. So the Hebrew Bible, that's the Old Testament. The Hebrew Bible does allow for divorce. Just sit with that for a moment. <laughs> 
right? I mean, that's a thing. It's it's legislated, right? Okay. Well, oh, I'm having issues here. Um, that is referenced in Deuteronomy 24 verses one to four. And what what is really sad to me, and yes, I'm using the language on this slide intentionally. I'm not trying to make you uncomfortable, but I kind of am, right? Um, the language in those four verses makes it very clear that women are property and that a woman is claimed by a man when he just has sex with her. That's how she, he claims her. In, that, in those four passages, those four verses, it's saying, you know, if a man divorces a woman, he gives her a certificate of divorce, sends her on her way, and another man marries her, and he decides he doesn't like her, that first man cannot marry her again because she is considered defiled. The act of having sex with a man defiles her for another. We're talking what's so, you know, again, I, you all don't know me and I, we don't have, you know, kind of a long history of trust here, but it's really kind of interesting that all of the language around defilement of a woman's body is actually being done by a particular part of a man's body and penetrating her. I mean, it's really stunning to me if you if you get really honest about what the Bible says about things. So I just want to be clear that Deuteronomy 24, while it does say divorce is okay, it's also entirely objectifying for women. And it is focusing on her body as a thing as in this territorial way for men. Okay. And again, we don't have time to get into all the ins and outs. We're going to talk about this next bullet point in just a minute when we look at Matthew 19. But Jesus, here's the thing, folks. I know Jesus is our guy, right? <laughs> I know that. I get that. But guess what? He was human. And he reflected what his Hebrew Bible scriptures taught him to think about marriage, divorce, and women's bodies. And so anytime he is asked about it in the Gospels, he, conf he affirms this objectification of women and their bodies. He affirms that marriage is defined by a man having sex with a woman and claiming her. That's it. It's very base. <laughs> it isn't what I want for people today, right? And so this is a moment when if the, these words are put into Jesus' mouth, I want to be very clear that it is healthy for us to challenge that stance. I don't care who said it. <laughs> it's not what I want for people today. I don't care what kind of a relationship you want to be in, in terms of hetero, hetero presenting, bisexual, whatever, you know, right? You know, two men, two women, two non-binary, whatever, right? That's just not the way I want people to think about bodies and, and sex and marriage. So the, the language, the conversation within a biblical framework about divorce is mixed. There's a place where it says, yes, it's allowed. And then Jesus comes along and, and the Matthean Jesus kind of ratchets things up. He said, well, it's allowed, but actually this and actually that, and it's even more difficult. But the whole conversation, the reason that people think that divorce is a sin, thanks to Jesus's words, is because the two people who get divorced are assumed to that they will then move on and marry someone else and therefore have sex with someone else. The whole framework is on men claiming a woman's body. And the assumption, right, that someone else having sex with that same woman's body, right, is a, is a an offense to the first man or or whatever. But this whole thing, it's not it's not about the fact that these two families come together through these two people and you start forming bonds with each other's families and you depend upon each other. And so divorcing is hard and hurts and it's difficult. And what about the children and resources? That's what makes divorce hard. But all right, I'm going to keep moving because I think I could. I think I can. I think you got my point. <laughs> and if you did it, you can ask me about it in the Q&A. 
what does it say about sex before marriage? Again, I'd love to do a quick little, you know, what do you all think it says? What do you think it says? So here's the thing. What I want, let me briefly address that. Um, I think I have to be the one to do that, don't I? Um, people think that it says no sex before marriage. People think that's what the Bible says. And that isn't what it says. But why do they think that? Let's just address that very quickly, right? Most people believe, most Christians believe, and even people who aren't Christian who just kind of hear about and have a general sense of what the Bible says will tell you that the Bible says sex before marriage is a sin, right? Why? What is that based upon? This is based upon three things, okay? The first two are two biblical passages, Genesis 2.24, and 1 Corinthians 7, 9. And if you know these passages well, you know what I'm referring to. But if you don't, Genesis 2, 24 says, therefore a man will leave his parents and cling to his woman and the two will become into one flesh. Now, every single English translation I've consulted says the man leaves his parents and clings to his wife. And then they get, and then they get busy having sex. The Hebrew there does not say they are married. The Hebrew just says a man leaves his parents and clings to a woman and they have been the two become one. So bigger conversation there that to come, but, but it's because of that, that this change of the Hebrew word says woman and every English translation community has said, no, we're going to make that a wife. We're going to make them married. So everybody's comfortable with them having sex in the next part of the verse. <laughs> okay. First Corinthians, and by the way, that blew my mind the first time I realized that was what was going on. And I can tell you, I've seen it just go to lots of undergraduate students like, what? <laughs> that changes everything. Um, first Corinthians 7 verse 9 is the, pet. excuse me, the verse that says, basically, if you can't control yourself, you've got, you're too hot for your partner and you really, really want to have sex, then go get married so you can have sex. But that's not what Paul's getting at. And what, and I do talk about this a little bit more in depth in the book, but what he's saying is, Paul is down on passion. And if you're if you're not disciplined enough to be able to contain it yourself, well then, oh yes, okay. Go get married so you can have sex. So yes, he thinks you can't have sex before marriage. That is what's happening. But he's talking about go get married. That will help you put out your passion. Not marriage is where you get to indulge your passion. No, no. So he's not even on the same, like he's not even having the same conversation as we are. He is anti bodily desires and passions. Okay. I certainly know friends in college who got married because they were just too hot for each other and couldn't handle it. And that doesn't last well. Anyway, go well over the long term. Anyway, the other thing, and, and this is hard to do. I have several ch charts in my book about this. It's hard to talk about. It's easier to show you. Um, but the other big reason that most people think that the Bible says you don't have sex before marriage is because every time there is there's a there's a couple being talked about, the language of marriage is put upon them. But in the biblical context, we one of the things I suggest in my book is we should if we wanted to be true to the Hebrew and the Greek in the Hebrew Bible and Newer Testament, we wouldn't see husband or wife in either testament. We would just see man and woman. Yes, it's a relationship we think of as being a marriage, but they didn't call it that. They didn't have labels for it. They didn't even have a verb that meant to marry in the way that we mean for marrying. They didn't talk about it the same way. So of course, okay. So, and the other thing about this is you, you know, I'm, I'm going to get to in the next next section. So sex before marriage, this is why people think the Bible says sex before marriage is a sin, but the Bible is actually not saying that in any of these cases. So let's keep moving to what does it actually say then about sex before marriage? So I want to highlight, if you haven't noticed already, that one of one of the reason, one of the things about the Christian Bible that I raise in the work that I do around this topic is that we do only have hetero 
presenting relationships that are talked about. So I, every time I talk about this, I'm, it feels like I'm reinscribing or reinforcing hetero relationships because we only have men and women who are being paired up um, in what we call a marriage. That is a part of the problem or the, that, is, that has influenced the way people think about this relationship, right? So I just want to keep noting that as we go, that... I know that I'm saying men and women are getting married and that's it. That's, that's a bigger piece of this conversation. So what does the Bible say about sex before marriage for men? So, well, here's the thing. Men get to have sex with women in order to claim them as spouses. There is no marriage ceremony ever spoken of in either Christian Testament. Okay. A man purchases a woman, goes and has sex with her, and now they're married. It's almost like sex before marriage is impossible in that case, or when it's convenient for the man, because there are also times when a man has sex with women he's not married to, and there's no problem here. Let me give you an example of what I'm saying in order to drive home. Actually, again, this was an aha moment for me in a big way when I was researching for this book. Lots of people know about Leviticus 18 and 20, right? Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. There's a verse in those two chapters, right, that says, do not lay. A man shall not lay with a man as he does a woman. It's an abomination. And in one of them, we're going to put you to death, right? Um, what I had not really stopped to take in, and therefore I'm assuming a lot of others had not either, is the rest of the list and what the rest of those two lists implies. The rest of that list implies that there are a bunch of hetero-oriented men who need boundaries on which women they can have sex with. It's not even talking about marriage. It's saying, don't have sex with any woman you'd see at a, at a family reunion. That's what those two lists are saying. And guess what? Hetero men needed that list twice. So this isn't an issue. It's just don't have it with them. <laughs> It's not a problem. We just don't want you to have sex with your brother's wife, okay? Men were doing that. It's, it was to the point where it was given boundaries, okay? And then, of course, the sir point, men, were, men had sex with women in their households whom they owned as slaves. And, of course, we, we all know the two big examples, right, At, um, Abraham and Jacob both had forced themselves on, I think we should say, women who were enslaved to them. I don't know why it keeps doing that. Oh. <sighs> It's really hard. And I, I've had people push back, you know, well, Hagar was, Hagar was, you know, Hagar saw the bigger picture. So she, I think she was okay with it. <laughs> really? Well, I, I don't even know how to come back to that. You know, Bill Han Zilpah, the two maids, actually they're, ser they're slaves, uh, that came along with Leah and Rachel. So Jacob's having sex with four different women, two of which he's married to, and the other two, he's just for fun and, and, building the family but he's not married to those two that's sex for men outside of marriage right women however everybody gets to like okay here we go right i don't know to what extent you've sat with this women are considered defiled in the hebrew bible and we don't see that language specifically in the newer testament but we do have stories like the woman at the well um you know <sighs> they've been married four times in the and like poor woman she's probably married to four different brothers you know what i'm saying that whole leverett marriage thing Nobody, nobody stops to comment on what that must have been like for her. We just judge her for having sex with more than one guy. What? What? I literally heard that growing up, right? So women are considered defiled if they have sex outside of or before marriage. Men are having it whenever they want to. And women's bodies are defiled by that dude she just had sex with. But she's the problem. Not okay with that. Just not. 
woman, at least in the Hebrew Bible, again, I didn't, I don't, we don't see it in the Newer Testament. The Newer Testament's doing different things. We have a lot of narrative, much more narrative in the Hebrew Bible. But women needed to be prepared to prove their virginity. And this is a thing I really have an issue with. Um, I, I, in case you don't know what I'm referring to, um, the proving virginity was to be able to present the sheets that she bled on, right, the night before to prove that she had not had sex before. Um, this is a topic and a conversation I've been having with undergrads for years, and I talk pretty bluntly about these things, just so you know. So I don't intend to make people uncomfortable, except I do a little bit if you haven't, if you aren't haven't been having this kind of a conversation kind of honest conversation about human bodies and sex and sexuality so there's this thing that comes out of biblical texts that is still alive and well today and that is this idea of virginity which in the biblical context was different than I think it tends to be talked about today. Today, people will actually, males and females and non-binary folks will talk about like, well, you know, I'm a virgin, I haven't had sex. But in the biblical text, women were, <laughs> the label virgin is assumed to be a female, first of all. If you want to talk about a male who is a virgin, you have to qualify a male virgin, but virgin is just a female. Okay. Second of all, the, the idea of a woman's body being changed because a male's penis has penetrated her. Therefore her body has changed. Her hymen has been broken. We see this blood that is, that is fiction right? A woman's, a person with a hymen, a vagina and hymen is not qualitatively changed because she's, they, that body has been penetrated. It's not. It's, it is actually just not. It is a physiological fact. The membrane called the hymen is ridiculously uh, flexible if you just give it a chance, right? So this ancient idea that a woman is a thing, property, territory, and she's claimed by a man and the proof that he's the first to go there, right, is that she bleeds. This is actually evidence of violence being done to her body. It doesn't have to happen. A woman's time, a person's hymen can be prepared. And so I start to get really angry. <laughs> I'm trying to keep a lid on it right now. This, this whole conversation about virginity makes me so angry because it is one of the more disgusting elements of an ancient view of women's bodies that has been, that is still, some people still believe that, right? Because they're not informed about a woman's body. And I get it. I don't judge that people still think that way because I get it. So what does the Bible really say about sex before marriage? It has this permissive thing for men. It has objectifying laws and, you know, stories for women. And then there's this other element. So this isn't biblical, but it's we extra biblical passages and laws and, and narratives tell us that there were some Jew engaged Jewish couples that lived together for a year before marriage, period. Like, just take that to the bank, okay? <laughs> in more urban settings, for sure. And then of course, there's a Song of Solomon. Um, I do a live stream twice a week. Actually, it started based on this book because this book was coming out. Here's the cover, by the way. Um, and, and so I started reading passages. I started in Genesis and I started reading passages, you know, just twice a week, Tuesday, well, I started doing it every day of June. And then now I'm doing it Tuesday and Thursday. So I had one this afternoon. And this afternoon's passage was actually reading the book Song of Solomon and talking about sex and what's it saying about sex and blah, all the near, you know, all the metaphors and all the good stuff. Um, so it's fresh on my mind. But the book Song of Solomon, you know, 
I, again, I don't know you all. I don't know where you're coming from with any of this. I know that a lot of people are taught to read the book Song of Solomon um, through spiritual lenses, that this is Christ's love for the church or God's love for his people. And I just, I'd ask you to go oh, read the first few verses and tell me if that's still true. Kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Like, that's not Jesus and the church. <laughs> it's a woman wanting to go make out with her boyfriend, okay? <laughs> Chapter four talks about, um, you know, like an apple tree in the forest is my the my lover among men or whatever. And I delight to sit in his shadow and his fruit is sweet to my taste. Are you kidding me? This is oral sex, right? Um, and I mean, come on, it's, you know, if you're not looking for it to be spiritualized, you see what's going on. And there are a lot, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot going on there. Um, some of it really clever, some of it just kind of obvious and blunt, but it's, so, you know, ancient, historically speaking, rabbis and Christian men have been in, very uncomfortable with the idea that this is actually just celebrating sex <laughs> and f physicality, loving someone else's body. Um, so they turned it into God and, and, you know, I need to stop talking about it because it just, they're all these things, you know, like these female mystics over the, in, over the centuries have talked about their love for Christ this way, their love for Jesus this way. And those women are thought to be crazy, but those women are just doing what the traditions were teaching people, which is to spiritualize it. And this is about Christ in the church. And so they do. And <sighs> so many things talk. Okay. So I think I need to have about, what do you say, nine minutes for this or something, Ophelia? Um, ish. Okay. So what is biblical marriage? So this just, I just want to be clear that the first four chapters of my book talk about this. So there's a lot to say. So let me, let me start out by saying, if you're not already familiar, you might be, but if you're not, these are the four passages, generally speaking, that if a person wants to use that phrase, biblical marriage, these are the verses they think of as defining what they mean by that. And so just going down the list, Genesis 1 28, they take to mean a marriage should be procreative because Genesis 128 says, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. 224, they think means no sex before marriage because a man leaves his parents and clings to his wife and then they have sex. Oh, but that's not, not what it says, right? But that's what people think. Matthew 19, four to six is cherry picked very much out of context. But those, those three verses people take to mean there will be no divorcing, okay? And then Ephesians 5, 31 and 32 makes this union between a man and a woman is compared to the union of Christ and the church. So Christ is a male and the church is always talked about in a, as female terms, a bri the bride to Christ. So what's interesting is, yes, Ephesians 5, 32 makes it very difficult for Christians to get on board with seeing any relationship beyond hetero as okay. I think that's important to note. I am personally perfectly fine with people beyond hetero relationships, right? But, but if you've thought that your whole life or you know people who do, they come by it honestly. That's an important piece to, t to, to, take, to take note of. Okay, so, what is the highlight that I would like to offer you to reframe the ideas here? Okay, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. We have a couple. One, we've done a good enough job with that. We can, we can maybe just stop that, right? We have an overpopulation issue. Um, let me also suggest in verse 22, Genesis 1, God also in this narrative, this fun, beautiful day by day development of the world, narrative also tells the fish of the sea and the birds of the air to be fruitful and multiply fill the earth and subdue it fill 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 the earth and then this claim in 28 is actually to all those creatures created on day six so that means the animals on the plant on the earth as well this part of the narrative is just blessing this natural phenomenon that animals and people know how to get busy making more of each right nobody needed to be told that and if you need a third nugget at least for now, do you know what 129 says? 
because 129 says humans are supposed to be vegan. What I think is really interesting is that for centuries, right, many Christians have focused on being fruitful, <laughs> right? Um, and disregarding the whole be vegan thing. And so now we have an overpopulation of the planet and global warming issues because of it in, in part. And if we switched our focus from, yeah, we can tone down the reproduction thing and maybe we should eat more plants. <laughs> Fascinating how that would change things around a little bit. There's a lot more to say about Genesis 128, but it is not talking about marriage. It's a narrative about the development of the world. It's not a command about marriage. So when people get hung up on sex needing to be procreative, well, of course it does, because we wouldn't, you know, we need if we want to continue to exist. But that's not the only purpose of sex. And people hang on to this verse as if that is all that matters for sex, and it is not. We can also take the opposite end, hetero couple or hetero presenting couples. You know, when a woman reaches menopause, do they have to divorce or just not have sex? You know, all the couples who choose not to have children, buy your children, you know, do we, can they not be married? Right. You know, so, and this is the one I was talking about earlier, so I don't need to spend too much time on this, but Genesis 2, 24, a man shall leave his parents and cling to his woman and they become one flesh. I cannot tell you how radical that was for me the first time and how important it is. And I think that sometimes people don't fully get how important that is. But this isn't talking about marriage either. Chapter two of Genesis, as I talk about in my book, chapter two of Genesis is talking about humans needing partnership, companionship, perhaps a life partner. But there's no language for spouse. There's no language for marrying. It's just... God creates a human and says it's not good that this first that this first human is alone and that first human isn't male by the way and and so they tried out all the animals he need this first human needs a equal as its partner let's find it one right and so and there's a lot more to say about this but I need to I need to keep moving due to time Matthew 19 4 to 6 researching for this for the book was the most dramatic piece for me so I'm gonna just highlight what's happening here so what people quote so people who say biblical marriage there will be no divorce because of this right so verses four to six jesus answered have you not read that the one who created them at the beginning and jesus quotes genesis 127 which says created the male and female right so people think about only male and female in a marriage even though genesis 1 isn't talking about marriage okay and then quotes 224 what we just looked at and then Jesus says, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. This is pulled out of context, and that disturbs me as a biblical scholar. But even if this is all we're going to look at, I'd like to invite you to reconsider something. And that is what we're seeing being said from cover to cover about sex. What to suggest that two people having sex is God joining them together. I, I personally find that wildly disrespectful to a couple because what makes them two, what makes the two one isn't about what happens in the bedroom. It's about how they live out their lives the rest of the time, right? There's so much to say about this, but even this idea, this claim that God is joining, joins two people together when they have sex, I just think that needs some reframing. And I'll leave that one up to you to, to do because I, I do need to keep moving. But it's, it's really fascinating. So here's the thing, though. Those three verses, four to six, are quoted out of context. And here's what it's really about. Jesus is approached by some Pharisees, teachers of the law, and they ask him, well, which reason of divorce are you okay with, basically, okay? And so what Jesus does as the, the second, right, what Jesus does is he plays out an age-old debate. There has already been, there have already been Jewish rabbis and teachers of the law who've already been having a particular debate, and it involves 
Genesis 1, 27 and 28, Genesis 2, 24, and then Deuteronomy 24. That's That has already been going on. So he engages, the, the he plays along. The thing that he says that's new is not the part that people quote. Verses four to six is not something Jesus is saying that's new. That is all a part of the debate that's been going on for centuries, okay? What he says that's new is what happens after that. Starting in verse seven, they have this conversation and Jesus' disciples are like, oh my gosh, if that's the case, it's better not to marry to begin with. And Jesus' response is silence on that. Like, yeah, maybe it's better not to marry to begin with. In fact, <laughs> what I'm about to say is going to blow your mind. And that's when he brings in this conversation. He references eunuchs. And he says, some are born eunuchs. Some are made eunuchs by others. Some make themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. Anyone who can accept this should. That's not the wording. It's let anyone who accept this. Sorry, I'm off on the wording, but basically, if you can handle it, do so. Okay, here's the thing about this passage. It starts out about divorce, and he shifts the whole conversation around, which is really kind of fun. Um, he does affirm that marriage and sex and divorce is all a problem because of sex, and then he flips it all around and says, maybe you shouldn't get to married to begin with, which might be about apocalyptic concerns. It doesn't matter to me. The words of Jesus are challenging family values, ideas. I think that's a thing to sit with. Don't brush it under the carpet. Just let it be what it is. Okay? But when he starts talking about eunuchs, the, the, most people today think he's talking about celibacy, right? No. No. Yeah, I like that some of you are like, no, you know that's not about celibacy. That's awesome. This isn't news to you. Okay, but in case it is news to you, um, eunuchs in the first century were known to be um, adept at sexual intercourse with men and women. They were also known to be uh, talked about as a third gender. Some people called them a monstrous something or other, but I don't think of it that way. The point is they were they were talked about as neither male nor female, so non-binary or both or something beyond the two. Whatever the reason for the author of Matthew's gospel to put these words into Jesus's mouth, it may have been to say it's better if we stop reproducing because the end is coming is soon. That may be what was going on, but it was certainly not about being celibate. To refer to a eunuch in the first century is to refer to a human being who is ostracized, right? A, a person who doesn't kind of, doesn't belong in a lot in many places, and who, even if it's not true about every eunuch, had a reputation of being um, quite good at sex with men and women. And in fact, we have we have documents about women, in particular wealthy women, preferring to have sex with, with eunuchs because of the automatic birth control. So it was significant for me as I read that research and the ancient texts talking about these things that to to be familiar with that. Okay. So I'm so the last part then is the last passage of defining biblical marriage is Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. Verse 31 is simply quoting Genesis 2, 24 again, right? So that's, it's a fairly significant foundational piece of this. And then verse 32 is what I talk about in chapter four of the book. And there's a lot to say about this. So for now, I'll offer you these tidbits. The author of Ephesians says, this is a great mystery. So you know, a man shall leave his parents and cling to his woman, the two become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I'm speaking about Christ in the church. Okay. That sets the, that prepares the way for sacramental language, actually, that begins because when the Greek is translated into Latin, the word for mystery, mysterium, is translated into sacramentum. And so 
uh, I'm drawing a blank on the dude's name. That's really Jerome, right? So thanks to Jerome, right? This language is taken in and it is, you know, it is preparing this way for the sacramental language that comes. But here's, there's, there are other things to say here. It is, dis, it is disconcerting, right? Because Christ is a male figure and the church is female. And so this is really strong um, in, endorsement for only hetero, even though, okay. Um, also the language of mystery here, mysterion in the Greek, this word is used in multiple places in the newer Testament. Interestingly enough, just in the letter of Ephesians, it's used about five or six times. And every other time when it's referring to mystery, it's talking about the mystery of the, the gospel or the message of God's grace in Christ. It's talking about this gift or this message. And so this is the only, this is a singular use of the word mysterion in the entire Newer Testament. Do with that what you will. It doesn't mean that it's wrong. It's just that and I kind of talk about this, it's hard to, you know, get into, but you see it in context and it's almost like he gets caught up in all the language and the metaphors he's referring to. And he just builds this great, interesting thing. And it doesn't even make a whole lot of sense really, but people have accommodated themselves to it. You don't have to agree with me, but that's, that's what I see. <laughs> so parting thoughts that are related to all of this, but not specifically asked for in a sense. I just want to remind you, right? What does Jesus actually say? Right? So for Christians, the two important guys are Jesus and Paul primarily, right? So what does Jesus say about marriage? He never speaks positively about marriage. In fact, right, we just noted in Matthew 19, he actually says it's, it's probably better not to marry. Take that to the bank. Don't play that down. Because that's the guy. It's okay to say those are ancient issues. But let's be honest about that, that he doesn't ever speak positively. In fact, and I've kept the next bullet points in biblical references so that we can be really clear. It's just a few places. <laughs> Luke 8, 28 is the passage where he talks about leaving your family to follow him. Come on now. That is so anti-family values. I don't even know where, right? In fact, I had an exchange with a young evangelical woman who was newly married. She's like, I'd be fine if my husband left me to go follow Christ, if that was his calling. And I just wanted to call bullshit on, oh, sorry, BS on that. Um, I'm like, yeah, you don't have Christian, you don't have children or mortgage yet, do you? <laughs> um, Sorry about the language. Luke 20, verses 34 to 40. That's the passage where Jesus is confronted by people who don't believe in the afterlife. And they, they posit this scenario of a woman marrying um, five brothers, right? Or is it seven? I think it's five brothers. And they say, well, who is she married to in heaven? And Jesus is like giving them a, you know, a what for about them not knowing the scriptures about heaven. He doesn't, by the way, say we should probably do away with that practice of a man purchases a woman and he dies without giving her children. So his brother's going to come in and have and do the brother and the brother in law duty to her and have sex with her. They're not actually married, by the way, even in the biblical language, the, the next brother just goes in and has sex with her. If he dies without giving the next one goes and has sex with like it's just awful for the woman and we don't ever talk about that jesus doesn't take this moment to set the record straight that we should stop objectifying women he's more concerned about them not understanding you know how things work in heaven or whatever and then of course matthew 19 which we just discussed so again i think this is probably not news to any of you okay but i just want to highlight it for you if Jesus and Paul were not married, what are we doing? Why would the church have any sort of message that mar being married was an important thing? I have an answer to that. And I think it's about because the only time directives are given to people outside of a general thing, it's to people in married, in married relationships, which is concerning but here's but this is the reality neither one of them were married that we know of so maybe we could just back off a little bit on that but that's complicated i know and the thing is both jesus and paul only talk about marriage in light of sex 
and a, and the sex acts specifically, right, of a man performing sex on a woman. They don't ever talk about sex in any kind of healthy way. And they talk about marriage as if it's defined by sex. Ask yourself or any of the people you know who are married, right? If you're not married, or, uh, right? What, what is it that makes your marriage great? You know, what, what defines your marriage? Pretty sure sex will be in the top five. <laughs> and then my final thing to consider, there is, there is no biblical example of what most of us today consider healthy um, foundation starting points for marriage, which is it's mutually agreed upon by two equals and built on love. That is not, those three together do, do, do not happen in the Bible. Um, and this is a quote from page 132 of my book. Do you see the connection that is being made for people of faith over and over again? When the only advice on marriage, which is usually the heading on chapter on 1 Corinthians 7, something about marriage, advice on marriage. When the only advice on marriage from Paul is about sex. It is this conversation about marriage is really a conversation about sex, who is allowed to have it, and is it being procreative? And sex itself is so much more than that, right? So that is it. Dr. Bird, thank you so, so much for this incredible tidal wave of <laughs> um, not just yeah. your scholarship, but also your humor and compassion. Thanks so much for inviting us into a deeper conversation about mm. so many topics that, you know, you, you've just scratched the surface of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and mm -hmm. thank you for being honest about what scripture mm -hmm. says and doesn't say. Um, I think that somebody in the chat earlier had put it pretty well that like, you know, we don't, we don't need to defend the Bible right now. Um, and if we can take an earnest look at what it says, then perhaps it can teach us a little bit about who God is and teach us a little bit about who we are as God's creation, um, as God's good creation. Yes. Yes. I want to honor. Oh, go ahead. Well, and I just want to say, I think a lot of times it's really just telling us what ancient people thought. And mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm not judging them for that, but that sometimes missed the mark on what is what human sexuality, human relationships are and can be and maybe should be. Um, so I, you know, I, I don't, right. Okay. I just want to say, I think there's, I think some of those we ought to be able to look at and say, this isn't healthy. I get that it's in my Bible and I get that maybe even Jesus is saying it, but it isn't healthy. We need, to, we need to be able to say that. Mm. And I know that's scary for some people. I do know that. But I, I also think that, especially if you're here, you've got some courage. It's okay. And I'm going to give you permission to say that, to speak back to the Bible when it is harming people. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Let's have an ongoing dialogue with the Bible instead of just ingesting everything that we take at face value. Um, for one translation. Yeah, it is open for our conversation and um, for the Holy Spirit to conjure something out of um, with our, our honest uh, wrestling. Yes. Dr. Bird, um, I just want to remind people that they can go to your website, jennifergracebird.com. Um, and that is here in the chat. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about Dr. Bird's work, um, and you can also check out her video series there, um, this book, this fantastic book that we've been hearing about. Um, but I think that um, I do want to honor people's time. Tom, absolutely. And... I'm sorry that I went long. I was trying really no, hard. No, no, to... <laughs> it's full of so much good information. Good, I appreciate good. that so much. Um, but yeah, thank you for yes. your engagement with the Reconciling Movement, for your ongoing advocacy. We are deeply grateful to you. Thank you. Everyone, thank you so much for your participation. Um, keep an eye out on our social media or emails for more events like this. 
Um, we are grateful for the ways in which you are learning and um, continuing to live out Jesus's ministry wherever you are. Thank you all and be well. Yes, hygiene. <laughs>